Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? His resurrection means our getting ready to go to college, I had this sort of mentality with God that was like, um, you don't got to worry about me, man. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm fine. It, through college, I, I really did feel like I was kind of on my own. I asked for it. I mean, I, I literally asked for it. And so I was looking for community and friends and stuff and nothing ever stuck because again I was avoiding thinking oh I don't need this I don't need the churches I don't it's need like whatever. a box checked or something yeah yeah so then you you go to college you do your best and then you get a job at the end and you do all this stuff and then I felt like I was stranded with this degree yeah, that I how I, many people I feel wasted. that way I, I put all my energy in it. I had, I had sacrificed my own happiness and my, I was stressed out about this. And then I get to the end and they're like, oh yeah, we have no jobs for you. 
you know, it's depressing. It's, it's, it's shattering. So, you know, you live like that for a little bit and it just wears on you and you're depressed and you're not doing anything. And then finally, I just had this like complete breakdown of ego. It's just shattered. I'm like, okay, clearly I am not strong enough to face this world. Wow. And I was scared because it had felt like I had spent so much time walking away from God. And I was like, okay, I know what that path looked like all the way out there. Now I got to turn around and walk back. I turned around and he was there again. Jesus is there and he loves you. He's at the gates. He's at the gates of hell saying, come back. Yeah, it was not a long walk back. It was the prodigal son. He met me at the gates. Yeah. Thing. And so an opportunity uh, came for work out here that was, you know, tangential to my degree, at least. When I took it, came out here. And so when we come to encounter, it felt like that home that I was looking for. It really did because it didn't just feel like something where we show up on Sunday and then like, cool, see you later. It felt like a community. It some people like were investing something in Something that yeah. existed Monday to Saturday as well. And I, I realized that's what we wanted. I don't care how strong you think you are or smart you think you are, like you cannot face the world alone. And that's okay. Yeah. You need a community, you need God, you need these things, and it's not like a weakness. I, I always viewed it as a weakness. Having something that's based in scripture, which mm. you would think yes. is every church, but once you start looking around, you realize it's not every church. And I think that was a big shock it's because that's the steady rock that everything is built yeah. on. The, Your family are just well, rock, I, rock star I, I people. I can only speak directly for myself, but I, from, yeah. from conversations with like my entire family, we're all extremely you know, happy to be a part of this community. Mike, what a joy. Hey, thanks again. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Emma, and I'm one of the youth directors here at Encounter. It is so good to be with you all this morning. Um, we're so glad that you came um, to church this morning to worship Jesus with us. If it is your first time here, either in person or online, we want to say welcome, and we encourage you to stop at the Welcome Center on your way out. Or if you're watching online, you can email the church office, and we'll get in touch with you that way. But at the Welcome Center, um, that's at the, the back doors and to the right, you'll see the tall tables. We have a welcome team, and they would love to say hi, and they would give you a small gift. Um, we also have something called a Connect card. You can fill that out and just give us any contact information if you choose to do that, and we'll stay in touch with you, keep you up to date on all the things happening here at Encounter. Um, before we enter our time of worship, I have a few other announcements about some upcoming events. And first is next week is Child Dedication Sunday. And if you are wanting to participate in that and have not um, reached out to the church, please do so by tomorrow. And you can do that just by emailing the church office. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, and then the next announcement, we have our Ash Wednesday service coming up. That is February 14th, 7 to 8 p.m. Um, this is going to be a great time to just prepare our hearts as we enter the season of Lent and journey towards Easter. Um, and then lastly, there's one more announcement. If you would turn your attention to the screen, it will be there. We wanted to do something different for Christmas Eve. And you, Dave Petruzio, and a couple other people got excited about the idea of bringing some of these kids that play a little more orchestral music. If you're a parent that already experienced this, mm -hmm. We're, we're letting you know we're gonna. Yep, we're gonna do it again. Try to lay down I some railroad I tracks. I would start working on something. Yeah. I kept my promise. We're gonna. We are working on it. For the kids that possibly did not participate in that. A similar sign up uh, in the lobby after services for a couple of weeks just to figure out, give everybody a chance because some people might miss. And if you miss that, I'll like throw an email address right here or something. Yep. You can kind of catch the. Yep. We get interest. Um, then thinking we'll have a have a parent meeting where we'll sort of get down and yeah. formally lay out, you know, here's the expectations of how often is rehearsal. Here's all the info. They can take that back and then we'll start, you know, rehearsing with the kids. I think good that if we're patient and we build on it slowly, it can really be a, a, a great thing for Encounter. Mike, I, I really appreciate you being obedient this way. And I know the phase of your life you're in too. You have a young child, a young wife. Watching believers be obedient is so infectious. So it's been a joy to get to know you, man. So thanks. Alrighty, if everybody would stand with me, we're going to say a word of prayer before we uh, worship Jesus together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, um, a new morning with new mercies. Thank you that your grace and mercy is um, so abundant. Thank you for your patience with us as um, we journey through life and 
fight temptation and fight sin, Lord. I pray that you would just help us to focus on you this morning, fix our eyes on you, God. Um, help us to fix our eyes on you as we go throughout the week and just um, help us to mute any distractions from the world and um, just amplify your, amplify your voice in our minds, God. I pray that you meet every person here um, this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill the room, God. Be with Vern as he um, preaches this morning, and um, may your words, or may his words be reflective of your words. May you speak through him, and I pray all of these things in your holy name. Amen. Good morning again, church. Um, privilege every week to worship with you and lift our voices together as one. I mean it. Um, I don't know about you. Sometimes I come in here, uh, oftentimes actually, and I don't feel like a person of power or a person that can light up the dark or a torchbearer. But Jesus says that we are, and Jesus says that we have the power to uh, do all that and more in our communities and our families. And we're going to sing like we believe it. I encourage you to lift up your voice. Let's take back from ground from the enemy here. Change. 
Take a minute. Don't look at me. Don't look at this stage and do business with your heart. Just ask him what he uh, is speaking to you about. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake
congregation. It's an honor for me to, um, to lead you in prayer. When we pray, we pray from our hearts. Don't have to use fancy words. God knows what we're feeling. You know, we're just saying about surrendering all. Wow, that's a lot. That's the only way, though. Um, we are community. I know a lot of you here and a lot of you I don't know, but we're doing life together, and that's part of that's part of what the church is. The church isn't this building. It's, it's you and me and trying to figure out how we live in this corrupt world, but we serve a risen Savior. So I, I ask you to join me, and I hope my prayer is your prayer. Father, we, we thank you that we can be here today, God, and we can, we can praise your name and we can hear your word. God, you see deep inside of us, and you know some of us, it's been a really good week. Wow, God, you've reminded us how fortunate and blessed we are and and there's many others of my friends here that this week has been difficult and that doesn't mean we don't trust you but god some are just dealing with stuff like can't deal with anymore there's there's sickness there's marriages that are on the verge of just like breaking and there's relationship issues with parents and children and 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 others in the in their families and and God, finances, some are just struggling to figure out what is the next day. God, we know that you have a plan, and we know that you brought us here for such a time as this. Our hope is not in this world that we live in, that our bodies live and work and reside and do things. Our purpose is in what you do. It's the kingdom that you built. So Father God, I ask the Holy Spirit to move throughout this sanctuary Throughout each person that's sitting here, all that hear my voice online, in person. I think about the kids and the teachers back in the Kids Connection and the parking lot and the, and the cafe and, and all on this holy ground, Father, because we come here because we do want to surrender all. God, sometimes we don't even know what that means because we become locked into addictions and, and habits that draw us away from you. But Father God, I pray that we, we can have confidence in you because you do not forsake us. It's, it's ringing in my ears that you never will leave us. We sure let people down. We as, as humans, we let people down. Sometimes on purpose and sometimes just consequences. God, you never let people down. Remind us of that. Remind us that we have a purpose, that we're beautiful in your eyes. No matter what our bodies, our hair, our face, whatever age we are, we are beautiful to you. And we have so much value in you. So Father God, as we worship today, Remind us that we were not a mistake, that we are part of your plan. And Father God, raise us up, challenge us, call us to do things, to make changes in our life. But God, help us to know we don't do it by ourselves. We're standing next to friends and neighbors. And if it's new for people to come here today, Father God, help them to reach out and make friends. God, this is what your plan is, and your plan is perfect. I think about Vern. Vern's going to come share what you put on his heart. You've allowed us to ask questions of the church 
and they're responding. God, help us wherever we're at. Sometimes I need things simple. Make them really elementary, God, because that's what I need to hear to understand. And I pray that the words that come out of Vern's lips, that he's prepared over his last 50 years of ministry, will give us confidence and a reminder that our Savior is risen and is in control and cares about every little thing in our lives. So Father God, you know our needs. So I pray that we can pour them out to you. I pray that you use this time to just energize us, that Sunday is no different than Monday through Saturday, that we are believers and we follow you. We make those sacrifices because we want to be bold, most of all because we believe in giving hope. And the hope that we have is the hope that only you can give because it's on a foundation of you, Christ. So Father God, encourage us. We are not the losers, we are the winners because we serve the risen King and I thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for all that hear my voice. Remind us, remind us, remind us, God. You will not leave us. I ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. One more time, church. Like the stuff that I would want to talk about wouldn't really be good at church, you know. But if you could ask about anything, what would you ask? Um, I don't know, just like, why does God seem so messed up in the Bible? And I kill him all the time. And Christians too. Seems like there's lots of crazy stuff Christians do, you know? Like we definitely never talk about that. So. See, it's not really super great questions for church. Totally. I mean, I have some of the same questions too, actually. I, they're good questions. Actually, a lot of older people at the church have the same ones. They just don't talk about it. You can always ask me any question you want, okay? If you're ever sitting there thinking, can I ask that? The answer is yes. You can ask that, okay? Okay. Well, good morning. I kind of wish the uh, worship team and Brock were still up here. Um, that song, I Surrender All, is as old as the hills. And yet it moves me every time we sing it. And uh, Brock and the others have such a gift of weaving together the old and the new and I appreciate it so much. I surrender all. It's a daily call and a daily request of God to put ourselves in his hands and surrender everything. So anyway, thank you to the worship team. If you see them, just uh, be uh, encouraging to them. And I want you to know that in general, this is such a special place. The encouragement just flows so freely. So uh, thank you for being such a good, encouraging group. I appreciate it. I've been gone for a month, um, and and you've been praying for me. You know, when you we drove from Harrisburg, where we live, to Santa Barbara, California, which is that's a long drive. And uh, weather was perfect both ways. There were places where it was snowing, but not where we were. And so I appreciate that. Well, can I ask that series? Oh, I need one little promotional announcement here about 
the growth groups, many of them are starting tonight, but because of the question and answer session tonight, uh, my group on uh, spiritual gifts will be waiting for this week and next week because it's Super Bowl and nobody's going to show up. When did the Super Bowl set the calendar? <laughs> it is what it is. It's all right. But anyway, the, the 301, you know, that we're doing through these discipleship sequence, 101, 201, 301. Well, it's 301 time, and uh, so we're going to transform that into a growth group. So if you've been to 301 once, come back. It'll be very different. The curriculum would be different. We'll talk about the same stuff, but we'll have good conversation and a bit challenging. So that will start two weeks from tonight. Well, can I ask that? Three questions today. Uh, I'm not going to be fair to all three. We're going to focus our time and attention to number one primarily, if they'll put that up there. Uh, please explain the Trinity. So Ted and I are on the phone with each other. I'm in the parking lot in uh, Los Angeles waiting to board a cruise ship. Life is hard. And uh, he's wanting to know, well, what's your choice for the, uh, the questions for this Sunday? And I, I looked him over and I said, well, I think I want to tackle the one with the Trinity. And so he says, fine. This past week, I get serious about preparing this message. And I think, yikes, Trinity. I'm not so sure I want to do this. Because if there's anything more confusing and troublesome in the life of the, the Christian church and its theology, it might be this one. God is three, yet one, one, yet three. What, what does this mean? The Trinity. Well, we're going to talk about that. But also then, is God a person? And then finally, how do we talk to non-Christians and prodigals, people who have fallen away from the faith, about Gnostic deceptions. Now, I'll give a little explanation of what Gnosticism is as we get to it. But let's begin with number two and get that one out of the way, because I think it's fairly easy. Is God a person? Um, I don't know how to read the Bible except to simply understand God is revealed to us in personal terms. Now, if that's not true, what you would end up with is a God of Einstein. Einstein believed in God, but it was a God of uh, laws and order and the universe functions as it should, and even the whole notion of relativity. It's all a part of an orderly universe. Well, that is probably right. It just doesn't go far enough. So we deal with physical laws. Uh, I dare you to break the law. No, I don't. I shouldn't say that. I was going to say I dare you to break the law of gravity, but that that one comes with a jolt at the end. So don't don't take me serious on that one. But that was Einstein's world, and it's he he brought us into so many revelations about what how the universe is constructed. What's really curious to me is. He was confronted with a Trinitarian kind of conundrum in the physical world, and it's called quantum physics. And after others are rolling out what this means, he says, I don't believe it, because a, a, a physical world of order and Regular things doesn't happen in the quantum realm. Now, the quantum stuff is electrons and so on. But he says, that God doesn't play dice with the universe. You can't have this kind of stuff. And so he didn't uh, buy into it. I wonder if he was alive today, whether he would even yet. But be that as it may, if you don't believe God is personal, but he's purely physical or order or laws of gravity and so on, then you've got a very different God. In the beginning, the Bible says, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and yet it was formless, empty, chaotic, 
darkness was on the surface of the deep. But God said, now there's where we get into the personal nature of God. God spoke into this world and said, let there be light, and there was light. And so we begin a journey in the Bible from the beginning, Genesis 1.1. God speaks, a very personal thing to do, and then things, <clears throat> things happen. Now, from a biblical and theological point of view, you'll often hear this in some basic class of Christian theology. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. In other words, he's present everywhere. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. This is God. But that's not really what the Bible wants to focus on. The Bible wants to focus on a relationship between God, the Creator, and His creation. So from creation, God said, and yet in the Garden of Eden, the center of God's creation, is a creature, Adam and Eve, and all sorts of other things. And God begins this conversation there. It's got language. It's got communication. There is a sense of God's personality coming through the garden. And after each day of creation, God said, it is good. And at the end of the whole week or six days of creation, God said, it is very good. So that's the way God designed it, to be good. Well, that's the beginning and the beginning of a personal God. At the end, Revelation chapter 21, look. It says in Revelation 21, God's dwelling place is now among the people. God himself will live with them. No more tears, no more death, no more mourning or crying in pain. Well, that's, again, personal. So I have no question that the, the world the Bible reveals about who God is and what he created is personal from beginning to end. In the creation, God is the creator, the ruler, the judge. With wisdom, God creates the heavens and the earth. You know, that is one of the choice translations of Genesis 1.1. We usually say God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But there are translations that say, with wisdom, God created the heavens and the earth. Where'd the wisdom come from? Well, it comes from Proverbs chapter 8. Wisdom, it says, was there at the beginning. Well, God is revealing himself to us, sometimes in big revelations, sometimes in little hints. But God himself will live with us. So we've got a beginning, Adam and Eve, a creature. It's good not to be alone, God said to Adam and Eve. And so God takes the Adam and splits it and makes Adam and Eve. Moses confronts God in a burning bush. God again speaks, Moses, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground, and so becomes a journey of freedom and salvation from slavery. God makes himself known to prophets, and again God speaks, and many of the prophets begin, thus saith the Lord. And so the communication in a personal com conversation from God happens. Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has always been there. The Spirit at the beginning was hovering over this empty, formless creation into which God speaks order. So the Spirit is there right from the beginning. He doesn't show up a lot in the Old Testament, but you can find several references to the Spirit. But he is absolutely present in the New Testament, very personal, very close. Mary receives an angelic visit about giving birth to a baby boy. And she asks a very appropriate question, much like this question we're dealing with this morning, because when she's told she will give birth to a boy, well, how can this be? Because I am a virgin. And the response, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and what is born in you will be from God. And so begins a journey that we know as our Christian heritage. 
Zechariah has a, a one-liner, if you want to put it that way, about the Spirit's work. It is not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit. So in the New Testament and with Jesus, we are suddenly opening the wide the doors to what God is doing and who God is and what kind of a person God is, a whole new consciousness, if I could put it that way, of God. But now also with a lot of new understanding about who God is. So to answer that first question I addressed, how do you explain the Trinity? What God is doing, bits and pieces, from beginning to end, is make himself known. To illustrate this, Jesus tells a lot of parables. But there's a story in Mark chapter 4 that is especially illuminating or enlightening. So it says that Jesus taught in parables, and it gives probably a half a dozen of these different parables, you know, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the sower and the seed. And so he tells parables. And when the day is finished, at least his teaching is finished, he says to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side. And so they all climb in a boat, and off they go, and Jesus is weary and tired, lays down in the boat, and goes to sleep. And a furious storm comes up, threatening their life, threatening to drown them. They wake him, panicked. Jesus, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus gets up and speaks to the wind and to the waves. Peace be still. Now the disciples were afraid, but now they, the word says this, they were terrified. And now the question is, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, that's what the Trinity is trying to do. It's trying to explain who is this man? In Mark chapter 2, there's a paralytic. Friends bring him to Jesus because Jesus has gained a reputation of healing people. And so they dig a hole in the roof because of the crowd and lay him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus heals him. And he says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And there were those in the crowd who were saying, why does he talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? And of course, the answer would be exactly. The same one who's forgiving sins is the same one who's healing a paralytic. And so there is this revelation of who God is. But the Trinity comes along as a way of saying, this is our best effort at explaining who this man is. Lots of people don't believe it. Uh, you've heard of the Unitarian Church. They do not believe it. There's just one God. That's it. That's simple. That's straightforward. But throughout history, Christians, Orthodox Christian theology has believed in a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But I don't mind telling you that really, really muddies the water. So is God three or is God one? And if he's just one, well, what about these manifestations as spirit or God the Father? We don't see the spirit. We don't see God the Father. We see Jesus. So it's complicated. Who is this man? So we, I think, folks, that the reason the Bible is written the way it is with four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all sorts of letters circulated in the early church, you know them as Romans and Philippians and Ephesians and so on. Those are written for us to ask the question, who is this man, Jesus? If it were simply a great teacher, maybe even a great healer, we could accept that. But the moment we turn him into God, we've got a new problem. Who is this man? So let me deal with that for a few moments. After the resurrection, 
Jesus appeared to his disciples. But before his appearing, they're locked up in a room. Now what do we do? There are still the enemies of Jesus who are out there. Are we going to put ourselves at risk to have the same fate of Jesus crucified on a cross? Now what do we do? Jesus enters this room with his presence. One of the disciples, Thomas, whom we have come to know, to know as Doubting Thomas, says, you know, I will not believe it until I put my finger in his hand and my hand in his side, those wounds of Jesus. When Jesus makes his appearance, he says to Thomas, come here, put your finger right here. Put your hand right here. Stop doubting. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. So Jesus is more than a great healer. Jesus is more than a great teacher. Suddenly there is this awareness that he is God. The stories of the New Testament and the teaching of the New Testament are all bringing us to an understanding of how to answer the question, who is this man? So when we define the Trinity as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, theologians come along and say, but what we really mean by that is all three are equal, all three are eternal, all three are made of the same divine substance. It was an early church history that said, uh, heresy that says, well, Jesus came along later. First there was God the Father, and then later we have the Son. No. The interpretation of the early Christians, and would be ours to this day, is Jesus is co-eternal right from the beginning. He even says at one point, before Abraham was, I am, that divine name or title given to Moses before the burning bush. Now, Jesus, a man we could talk to, a man we could touch, a man we could listen to, and lots of people did, is firmly planted in the course of our human history. But if it were just that, we wouldn't have a trinity. We would have a revelation of some of the special uh, attributes about God, love, and other things. But when we get dabble into the th essence of the Trinitarian theology, it gets all muddied. And I could wish to say it wasn't muddy, but it is complicated. It's confusing. There's all sorts of misunderstandings about it. There's all sorts of conflicts about it. Who is this man? Is he the Spirit? Is it Jesus in the flesh? Is it God, the Creator? Well, Christians took 325 years to hammer out a statement of who God is. We know it today as the Nicene Creed. And here's what it says. I will abbreviate it for the sake of time. But number one, after 325 years, this is who we think this man is. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. And it goes on. And finally, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. So it's a statement of faith. This is who God is God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem is, lots of people don't believe it. I've had some of them attend my churches over the years. Well, I don't have much trouble with God the Father or Creator or Judge, but uh, making all these other characters on equal par with God, as we understand Him, is a problem for me. The Unitarians don't believe it. The Unity Church doesn't believe it. And others in history have all had difficulties with it. So who is this man? The reason we have 
muddied waters about who God is and the Trinitarian explanation of who God is, is that we come up against one big whopper of a question about the identity of Jesus. Now, we know him as a person identified within history, and not just by Christians, but a historical figure. He was born, he lived, he died, and Christians will say he rose again and ascended into heaven. If we didn't have that resurrection event, none of this would be a problem. We could treat Jesus as a great teacher, a great healer, and just say that's it. But once he is resurrected from the dead, how do you explain that? Who is this man? If I can put it as briefly and succinctly as I can, if he is God, God by definition does not die. If he is a human, a human by definition does not rise from the dead. So who is he? And that becomes the foundation of the Trinity. So for faithful Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. Now, there's plenty of textual evidence for that, but time's pressing here. So let me shift gears a little bit. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, had a simple little illustration to uh, teach the Trinity. He says, imagine three candles and you light them all, and there are three distinct flames. But if you weren't looking at the flames, there is only one light. Three flames, three personages, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Paul gives us some insight into the Trinity from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15. Now, pay attention closely to this language because he's making some very careful distinctions. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. All right, no problem. We can kind of get the concept. God exists, but we really see the nature of God in Christ. But then he presses on to more detail. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, he made th the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. Can you hear that? Pre-existed. It's not just that Christ showed up one night in Bethlehem. This was a physical manifestation, but he's been there from the get-go. And he holds, the, the scriptures goes on, he holds all creation together. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says a similar thing. Long ago, ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. You hear it? The Creator, right there. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Some translations will put it this way. Christ is the exact representation of God. And then Jesus confirms this in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 9, if you're taking notes. In that scripture, he says to his disciples, listen, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll return and take you to where I am. Well, where are you going? Philip asks. Or no, that was Thomas. Thomas asks, where are you going? We don't know the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. And then Philip enters the picture and he asks a question that I've asked, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. 
if I could just have that glimpse, if I could just have that clarity, if I could just have that conviction, show us the Father. And Jesus rebukes him. You've been with me all this time and you don't understand? When you see me, Thomas, you have seen the Father. And so we are bringing this into focus that who is this man, Jesus? He is God. Now, I must press on to that third question. How do we communicate or talk to non-Christians about Gnostic deceptions? Well, what is Gnosticism? It is a belief that there is a secret, special knowledge that will open up the doors of enlightenment for you and for me. And if we can find that key that opens this door to enlightenment, then all of our problems will have a formula for solution. Gnosis, from which we get Gnosticism, is simply a word for knowledge. But in the Gnostic sense, it's hidden. It's only available to a few. It is not well known and you've got to strive to find it. There's no formula for finding it, but you work at it, you'll you'll get there. Here are the foundational beliefs of Gnosticism, core beliefs. Number one, they believe that this world is imperfect and even evil. Well, there's no doubt about this world being imperfect. I'm imperfect. We all are. Evil is not a word the Bible would put there. When God finished creation, he called it good. What has happened to his good creation is sin. That I, in the middle letter of the word sin, this self-indulgence, this self-centeredness that we are all guilty of. And in that sin of self-enthronement and God dethroned, in other words, that is the problem. Not that the world is evil, but what we've done to it. To be enlightened, then, is to be rid of all the physical imperfections. So for Gnostics, it was a way of getting rid of this physical world and pursuing a purely spiritual world. That's where the truth is. So the Bible says God created the world. It's good. It's even very good. The problem is sin and selfishness. Number two, Gnostics believe that The true knowledge is available, but it's hidden, and only a few will find it. Contrast that to Christian doctrine and Christian teaching. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever, not an exclusivity, whosoever puts their faith in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So there's nothing exclusive is transformed from grace, the gift of God, to whosoever, into a work. You must seek it, you must find it, you must pursue it, and if you're lucky, you'll find it. Let me give you a biblical foundation for it, because Gnosticism has been with us forever. So in Genesis chapter 3, God's good world has a serpent in it that is tempting Adam and Eve. And the serpent approaches Eve and says, did God really say, can you hear the words of doubt? Did God really say that if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you will die? No, 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 Eve. It's our little secret, this Gnostic special hidden knowledge. You won't die. When you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And so we become victims if we go down that road of heresy, deception. Another aspect of Gnosticism, there are no rules, there are no guidelines. You just find your way as best you know how. When you hear somebody say, I need to go off and find myself, well, that's what's going on. Contrast that with Jesus, who says very pointedly, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Don't just go wandering off here, there, and everywhere. Follow me. It's not like unlike what happens 
at the uh, base of Mount Sinai when Moses brings down the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are prefaced with this notion, I am the Lord your God who set you free, brought you out of the land of Egypt, the land of slavery. You will have no other gods before me. And so begins the teaching of the Ten Commandments. So we're not pursuing God in the dark, pursuing God in the unknown. God is opening a door, follow me. Put your faith in me, and then you will find your way. Gnostics say, do your own thing, find your own way. Well, when someone declares this, and you'll hear this in our day and age, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not really religious. Usually, I won't speak for all of them, they are trying to dress up their own self-indulgence, their own self-centeredness, their own disobedience to the God revealed as the way, the truth, and the life. Because we'd rather, frankly, like the old advertisement would say, I'd rather do it myself. Thank you. Now, Jesus tells us how to find enlightenment, how to find life, how to find salvation. Finally, Gnostics have a destiny that isn't biblical. So you're left to your own resources to find enlightenment any way you can. And if you don't find it, you're doomed either to a life of uh, confusion, a lack of confidence, no assurance of God's love and salvation, or in some versions of Gnosticism, it's a cyclical thing. You need to start over, reincarnation, do it again, and maybe you'll get it this time. So how do you talk to a Gnostic? about the truth of the Bible, the truth of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the error of this special hidden knowledge. You forever take them back to Jesus. When he declares things like John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. That is the light of the world. And this life is eternal to know God and the one he has sent. Jesus Christ. And I'm supposed to be done. All right, I am sort of. I leave you with a challenge that is just simply three verses. Philippians 3, 8, 9, and 10. Read it. Think on it. Pray over it. It is God's revelation to what he wants you to experience. Philippians 3, 8, 9, and 10. Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in the midst of our lack of understanding sometimes, Lord, be patient with us, but create within us a hunger, a desire, an ambition to understand who is this man? and therefore to understand the nature of God. Lord, in that pursuit, I pray for your, especially your Holy Spirit's abiding in us and with us, showing us the way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand if you are able. The risen King, the Lamb of God, all those things we're going to declare together and much more.
Thank you all for joining us. Um, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord together. Um, before we head out this morning, I just wanted to remind everybody of a few things. And first is um, Pastor Vern's challenge to us, which was to read just three verses this week. So it's a pretty easy one. It was Philippians 3, 8 to 10. Um, so find a few minutes this week to read that. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody of the ways to give. Those are on the screen behind me. Um, you can also give on the, in the drop boxes on the way out. Um, but we just want to say thank you for your generosity um, to Encounter. We do our best to steward the money well, to give it back to the Lord, to the community. Um, we have a lot of ministries here at Encounter. Um, so thank you for your generosity in that. Um, lastly, we have a prayer ministry here at Encounter. Um, there is a team of passionate believers, passionate about prayer. Um, and one or two of those will be at the prayer banner at the end of service if you would like prayer. And that prayer banner is at the end of the stage to the right. So stop by there on your way out. Um, thanks again for being here, and we can't wait to do it again next week.